New scientific techniques are helping archaeologists and historians interpret the past, but actually we can bring that knowledge back into the present. This is a lovely grassy hill um, just outside Winchester. It's called Magdalen Hill. So when you hear the name Magdalen anywhere, it's something to do with leprosy usually, because she becomes the patron saint of leprosy. So Mary Magdalene is the patron saint of leprosy. Actually, we know that there was something to do with leprosy, or we suspect there was something to do with leprosy on this hill in Winchester, because we have a bit of the Doomsday Book that was published in the 12th century that says there was a hospital on that hill. Nothing there now, but archaeologists thought, let's go and have a look. So they went and dug there in 2007, 2008, and they found the hospital, to cut a long story short. And they also found lots and lots of burials, which is what you expect with medieval hospitals. People were buried right next door to them. And these graves contained uh, skeletal remains, very, very well-preserved skeletal remains, as you can see there. And some of those skeletal remains had very obvious evidence of disease. So you've got evidence of infection in the bones. You can see that fibula, which is the lower bone in that image, has got a lot of florid new bone growth. That's what bone does when it's infected. There were also changes in the hands where the finger bones had almost disappeared, so they'd been intact by infection as well. There were changes in the feet, and in fact, one foot had been amputated. When you start to see this, you start to think of leprosy, because leprosy actually uh, attacks your nerves. So it means that you lose sensation in your extremities. And this is the point at which you go, as a paleopathologist, it's obviously leprosy. There's nothing else it can be. So leprosy directly attacks the facial bones, and you end up with this face that we actually call the face of leprosy, fascia's leprosa, where the palate, the upper teeth have mostly disappeared here. And if you imagine what this person looked like, I mean, that's soft tissue damage as well. So it's a deeply, deeply disfiguring disease, very stigmatizing disease. Now, this is a disease that is still with us today, but as a fraction of what it was in the Middle Ages. So there's about 200,000 new cases a year. And the World Health Organization is aiming to eradicate it by 2030. That's only six years from now. But I think they've got a pretty good chance of doing it. Uh, and I think they've got a pretty good chance because, first of all, they're focusing on improving access to healthcare in those countries. But we've got a new weapon in the arsenal which is genetics. So as you all know, we can identify diseases now on the basis of DNA. You know that because we have just lived through this and we have all experienced swabbing noses and throats and sending samples off for PCR tests. And PCR tests are genetic tests. You can do them for anything that's got DNA or RNA. And so you can do, you can do PCR tests for leprosy. And this is transformative, because it means that we can identify a patient with leprosy and we can test all their contacts, all their close family and friends. You usually find about a quarter of them have got asymptomatic leprosy, and you can start them on antibiotics. Because we have antibiotics, didn't have it in the Middle Ages. So if we can identify the patient, we have the, we have the tools to treat the disease now. And so with these, with these genetic tests, I think, we're going to get very close to combating leprosy and eradicating it. And we look back at the Middle Ages and go, why does it surge? Why have we got this incredible surge of disease from the 11th to the 15th centuries? And we, we can, again, look at the DNA of leprosy. Was it a new mutation which unleashed a new virulent version of leprosy? No, because we can compare the DNA from the Winchester skeletons with modern leprosy DNA, and it's not that different. So we don't think it's something that's changing within the bacterium itself. We think it was the fact that there's a lot more mobility and contact um, in the Middle Ages. I mean, some of it is to do with trade. Some of it is to do with crusades. So you've got large numbers of people moving from one end of Europe to the other. It's a brilliant way to transmit disease. But then another thing that was happening was tourism, or as they called it in the Middle Ages, pilgrimage. And one of the skeletons of a young man at Winchester had a very unusual item in his grave. You can see it there. Usually when we find shells in graves, they've just gone in with the, the, the 
sediment that you're putting back into the grave after you place the body in there. But this is actually a shell which has been modified. Look at the two holes at the top which have been carefully drilled in. Simon Roffey is pretty sure that he knows what this is, that it would have been a shell that was attached to a little bag, a little shoulder bag called a scrip. And it's a pilgrim's bag. It's a souvenir from having been to Santiago de Compostela in Spain to the shrine of St. James at Santiago. And the symbol of St. James is the scallop shell. So maybe that young man traveled to Spain and came back with more than just a souvenir, came back with a leprosy.